Hello out there, this is the irate veteran coming at you with a new video. Any veterans out there need any new veteran, new veteran advice, go to vamanders.com and I'll be happy to advise. Also, my book is out. Make sure you get a copy. Every veteran, matter of fact, every American needs to read it. Let me shout out a thank you to my sponsors. I am not recommending any specific lawyer or law firm to veterans. Veterans need to conduct their own due diligence before selecting a lawyer or law firm as their representative. That being said, thank you, Mr. Kindle and Hill and Potton and Mr. Rada and West and Dunn. There's links to their websites at my website. Let's get into our video. All right, today we have a video on foot and toe ratings. I have one of my sponsors with me. Let me let her introduce herself. She knows herself better than me. Hi, my name is Shauna Dunn. I am with the law firm of West and Dunn in the Madison, Wisconsin area. And I had the uh, VA disability administrative level practice there representing all our veterans before the regional office and the board. All right. So foot ratings, to me, they're just a huge deal because they can apply to so many ratings. So do you see a lot of secondaries in relation to feet? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in the past few years, I think that this has gotten even more attention as it well deserves uh, that secondary conditions really can be the way to get your rating to the place that it should be based on the functional and occupational impairment that you're suffering. Ratings for the feet in and of themselves, unfortunately, can be relatively low. It takes quite a bit to get to a decent rating for the feet. And so looking at these secondary conditions, that can sometimes kind of get you where you need to be. If you think of the feet, they're the base of the body, right? So anything wrong with the feet can alter the way you're walking, alter the way you're carrying weight on your body, and then, you know, kind of work their way up that kinetic chain and affect all of the other joints in the body, despite what VA says about that. Yeah, I know that. that's, that's uh, I think there's a lot of science to support that. And I know for myself, I mean, when my feet are giving me trouble, then so are my ankles and my knees and normally yeah. my back, right? So it's often if one foot's hurting, you're shifting your weight to the other side of your body. And now that's overweighted. Point is feet can really cause a lot of problems with your body. And if that's happening, you should definitely file secondary claims. Yeah. And I think it makes sense to talk for a second also about the obesity element. Absolutely. That opens up a whole new area. Right now we're looking at not just musculoskeletal conditions, but also at chronic disease. So your diabetes, your heart disease, things like that may be caused by your inability to move your body in a normal and pain-free way. That also leads to a whole another pot essentially of conditions we can be looking at. It, it affects so much the, your lower extremity condition conditions, it affects your ability to exercise at the appropriate level to maintain a healthy mm -hmm. weight, as well as the pain leading to depression, anxiety. So exactly. there's, there's it's a lot of things intertwined with mobility issues. Yeah. When I look at board cases, a lot of times representatives will try to get a higher rating using different codes. And mm -hmm. this case looks like it made it clear that if you have like flat feet, that's the only code you can use. You can't use some other code, even if it could lead to a higher rating. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that it's important then to ensure that the diagnosis is correct and that you have diagnoses for all foot conditions that you're dealing with. You know, you don't necessarily want to take just what the VA examiner has told you is wrong with your feet. You may want to see a podiatrist and make sure you're capturing all of the things that are going on with your feet. Uh, and that can help you kind of get around the need to try and shoehorn the symptoms you're having into a different code. You're going to probably get a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner as an examiner. I mean, you may in fact get an MD, but you're not getting a podiatrist. <laughs> so, so if you really need a full evaluation of your feet, so you may ensure you get the right codes assigned to your particular disabilities. And then I want to talk about painful motion. There's no motion measurements on feet. Yet, according to this case, the painful motion still applies if your disabilities on your feet happen to be painful. 
Yeah, uh, so the court said here that the painful motion regulation applies to the entirety of the musculoskeletal rating schedule. So the fact that a diagnostic code uses some criteria other than range of motion does not mean that you cannot ask for a compensable evaluation under this painful motion regulation. And you had pointed out here an exception for arthritis and generally arthritis in a minor joint and the, the foot is made up of a collection of minor joints would require at least two joints to be affected in order to be considered under that arthritis code. Code. But I think, you know, and we're going to talk a lot more about this, that it always makes sense to just present the argument. If you have painful motion in, you know, your big toe, for example, I would certainly argue that 4.59 applies to that. And VA may find that in your case, it doesn't because there are not other involved uh, joints in that minor joint group. But I've certainly seen it granted. And I think that it's an argument worth making. Completely agree. I always make the argument because the judge you get, if it goes to the board, that is, may in fact agree, right? So mm -hmm. I always make that argument. But at the same time, you veterans out there who have 0% for like hammer toe, or I'm going to chop this word up, pollux vulgus. I see zero all the time on those, right? And if you have no other foot conditions that are rated higher than that, then you should have those rated separately at 10% if they're painful. So make sure veterans, you look at your ratings and see where your feet ratings are at. You know, loss of use, this is really interesting that on a lot of the codes, they specifically say a 40% rating for loss of use. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think it's important to realize that loss of use does not mean that you can't walk, you can't stand. Loss of use means that you would be equally well served by amputation of the affected appendage and replacement with a prosthetic. So if you think about, you know, if you had your foot replaced by a prosthetic foot, you'd still be able to walk, you'd still be able to stand, you'd still be able to do all kinds of things. What you want to look at is what functions in your feet can't be replaced by a prosthesis, right? Your sense, perhaps um, your perception of where your foot is in space is hard to replace, impossible to replace with a prosthesis. The ability for your toes to kind of grasp the ground and propel you cannot be replaced by prosthesis. You really need to think about the function of that foot foot or hand when you're looking at loss of use and don't feel yourself limited to a complete, you know, lack of function in the foot. It's just that difference between a prosthetic appliance and your actual limb. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And there happens to be a board decision that I found that makes that actually clear what you just said mm -hmm. is here's a veteran who clearly says he has the ability to walk and stand, but really for no longer than 10 or 15 minutes before pain puts him down for the count, right? He has to mm -hmm. sit or rest. And the judge agreed that that, in fact, is a high enough level of impediment that it's loss of use. I think there's a lot of veterans out there, including me, who meet that description. Definitely, it's something if you're having a lot of mobility issues because of your feet, it's, it's a possibility to argue for this. Mm -hmm. so, and I think VA doesn't think much about it beyond that box that the VA examiner checks or does not check. And I think oftentimes the VA examiner does not check that box stating that they would be equally well served by a prosthetic. So I think it's really up to the veteran, up to the representative to make that argument and put that out there. No, I, I completely agree. And that's also, here's a point where a veteran statement is very critical to describe mm -hmm. His, his limitations imposed by his feet. Uh, yeah. And so that way, there'll be no question in the record what level of disability he's suffering from. Kind of fasciitis, though. That's kind of a new code, um, although it's been here a couple of years now. Most people who had this condition were actually rated under flat feet at one point. Now, if they were to file an increase today, it would fall under this now, right? Yes, correct. But it should not, because the schedule has changed and they're rated under a prior schedule, they shouldn't be decreased in their evaluation simply based on filing for an increase. But in order to get an increase, you're going to have to show that you meet one of these new criteria. And that's one of the things here it mentions about being a surgical candidate. Like my feet have been recommended for surgery. I don't want surgery. People can cut on me when they chase me down. As far as volunteering, no, I'm not doing it. Technically, I'm not a surgical candidate because I don't want to be a surgical candidate. I don't know if that would qualify, but I would certainly argue that it does qualify. Yeah, I think this is one of those places where you can get a little bit creative, right? There may be research out there about what does it mean to be a surgical candidate and does the patient's desire not to undergo surgery weigh in there? I'm, there might be something out there that would support that. Even if there isn't, I think
think that's certainly something worth arguing and talking to a doctor about, you know, what would you consider a surgical candidate? If I'm unwilling, then I think that clearly means I'm not a candidate. No, I, I completely agree. I, I definitely would argue that point to get to 20 mm -hmm. or the 30 because I have plantar fasciitis and it's extremely painful, especially after you're on your feet, after you sit for a few minutes and then you try to stand again, very painful. Yeah. You know, it's definitely a 10% rating is almost laughable, right? Yeah, so, right. And then here's a code I actually don't see you that often. I, I think I usually see it applied to bones that have been broke and then haven't healed properly, which mm -hmm. I just don't see that many of these. But pretty much there's the problem with rating this one in that moderate, moderately severe, severe, there's no definitions of those. So it's all in up to what your examiner checks the box for. And then that might not even work. So yeah. I've seen raters when the moderates or the severely moderate box is checked, where they say they don't care, they still give you the 10. I don't see this that often. True. Correct. Yep. I think here you can almost guarantee you'd start with the 10 and you'd have to argue your way up to whatever the correct evaluation actually is. Now, this is the big one. I see this more than any other foot condition. I went in for probably three compensation pension exams for my feet. And each time the person I get diagnoses me with one or two things, even though my podiatrist diagnosed me with 19 things. There's like a big problem with non-podiatrists doing these evaluations, which to me, if it's possible, veterans get a DBQ filled out by a podiatrist because you're not getting a podiatrist at that exam. Even if you've got a, a stack of treatment records from your podiatrist, they're most likely not going to talk about these things. You know, these are not treatment terms necessarily. You're not going in to see your podiatrist and talking about your marked inward displacement of the tendo Achilles. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you really need to ask them for exactly what you need. So you can either ask them to fill out a DBQ. That's probably the gold standard. It's going to get at all of the issues or even just present them with this rating criteria. If they're not willing to look at the 45 pages of the DBQ and ask them to provide a statement indicating which of these symptoms you're suffering from so that VA can accurately rate you. I went in for my feet so many times trying to get whatever foot orthotics or whatever it might be. And, mm -hmm. you know, the podiatrist always put down some descriptions, but the descriptions certainly aren't driving with the schedule. To me, if you get a DBQ filled out, get one filled out. Yeah, absolutely. Because some of these terms like mark deformity, pronation or abduction, and then it says, et cetera. So it's not mm -hmm. limited to pronation or abduction, these mark deformities, right? It can be any marked deformities that affect your feet. And again, you need someone to do that evaluation. It was difficult. Even for me, I had to go to four different podiatrists before I found one who was willing to actually yeah. do an inventory of my conditions. I, I just wanted someone to document, you know, what are the problems with my foot? Exactly. But the fourth one agreed to do that, right? So you might have to look around, but it's worth definitely getting a try because it, it might be the difference between a 30 or a 50% rating. Anything else you want to say about flat feet? With the feet in general, what occurred to me is that one of the things that VA is looking at is your gait, right? And here we're looking at whether you have pronation and something that can be helpful is to show them your shoes, right? If you can look at your shoes and say, look at these, they're all worn on the outside or they're all worn on the inside. When you go to the VA exam, the examiner is supposed to state whether there's any abnormal shoe wear. So you don't want to wear your brand new shoes that have no evidence of abnormal shoe wear if this is an issue for you. Uh, you want to wear those well-worn things that do reflect that gait disturbance if you have that. No, you're exactly right. I can actually think of a couple of exams where the podiatrist specifically asked me, let me look at your shoes. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they look at the bottom and they look at the wear pattern. Weak foot. This is one of the codes, although there is no place for it on the DBQ, it's kind of listed under other foot conditions. There is a short description there, but basically how people get diagnosed with weak foot is having these particular conditions and mm -hmm. probably not a other diagnosis. So here it, it yeah. talks about constitutional conditions. And of course, it's only 
naming a couple of them like disturbed circulations, for example, in weakness. But I imagine there could be other constitutional conditions. I've actually never had a veteran contact me with this condition. Most people have a diagnosis for something. Yeah, I've never seen this in use either. And all I can think about when I look at these criteria is that if I saw that constellation of symptoms, including circulation, which is not even a musculoskeletal issue, I'd be looking at other codes outside of the musculoskeletal section of the rating right. schedule. When I see conditions where the term weak foot might apply, generally they're due to neurological issues, neuropathy, radiculopathy, and you're going to get a much better evaluation under that criteria than you would here. Right. So I, makes sense. I have a hard time imagining a situation where there's nothing else going on and you just have a weak foot. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. There's something else for sure going on. Clawfoot, I don't see this a lot either, but it's a full schedule, kind of like the flat foot where it goes from 10 to 20 to 30 to 50. Again, I think it's important here to get a podiatrist to do a good evaluation. Uh, similar to the last slide, I've only seen claw foot in the context of other neurological conditions causing this atrophy of the feet, which causes the inward kind of contraction of the feet. So I think it's important to look at, you know, is something else causing this? And then to get a good evaluation by a podiatrist to kind of determine and if you have this condition where this properly falls in the rating schedule. Here, I see this one quite a bit. All right, I'm going to kill this word, metatarsalgia. And the other one's Morton's disease. They're both under the same code. They're both rated at 10, whether it's unilateral or bilateral. The big thing here is often I don't see it get a 10% rating because of other foot conditions. I think uh, the thing that's interesting here, just looking at these pictures you've added, you know, imagine if you've got pain every time you step on that portion of your foot, how drastically you might have to alter your gait. So while the 10% here is negligible, what are the secondary implications? I think that's where the value you may lie. No, you're right. Because I have this condition and I can already tell you, it really makes you change the way you walk. Yeah. And here's another one that I see often, probably as often as flat foot, because most people with flat foot end up getting what people commonly call a bunion, although technically the bumps the bunion, mm -hmm. the hollux vulgus is the deviation of the big toe towards your other toes. This is another one I typically see rated at zero because someone has, of course, flat foot already rated and the highest this can be rated is 10. And then there's questions about the 10 because the 10 has to be the equivalent of an amputation <laughs> or operated on with resection. You know, so there's a lot of things that go with this code, but then we can think back to our earlier conversation about painful motion or pain on use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, if you're 0% for this condition, painful motion would be exactly what I would argue. Beyond that, unfortunately, there's not there's not very much. Yeah, there's not a lot here, except that the same principle that you talked about last time is the change of gait, Yeah. right? Because this is, a, I mean, just look at the picture here, how that big toe is pressing against all those other toes. Mm -hmm. um, and shoe wear would probably, I can already tell you, I have, my foot looks exactly like this unfortunately. Mm. And it's very painful. To, it doesn't fit into any shoe properly. It's mm -hmm. very difficult. I walk with a limp on that foot because it hurts just for it to press the side of my shoe. But yes, veterans, again, if this is your only condition and it's painful, it should be 10, not zero, even if you haven't had the surgery, right? So mm -hmm. it's a painful, pain on use, painful motion. Hammer toe, same principle, really, as, as these other conditions. And because this is like even difficult to get to 10% rating, it says all your yeah. toes. I mean, I mean, it's like four toes. No, you get zero. All five. All right. You, you get the 10. Oh, thank you, VA. But again, if it's painful, even if it's one toe, it should have a 10% rating again yeah. with the consideration of pyramid, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Anything to say about this? I mean, I actually don't see this one that often, but I do see it. Yeah, I agree. I don't see this frequently either. Surprisingly, it seems like it would be a bit more common. But again, yeah, all toes, hammer toe would be incredibly difficult to walk around like that. Gate change would be the big deal. There have, I've read a lot of board decisions. And what I see is representatives 
which do their job, which just try to argue the best rating for their clients and veterans, of course, trying to get their better ratings. So they, like we already talked about, they might have a flat foot and they might try to use this particular code, which we're going to talk about here in a second, 84, 5284, which is foot injuries, basically. And they try to get a higher rating using that code. And of course, they can't do that if they have a diagnosed condition that's on the schedule. However, if you don't have a foot condition that has a specific code and you did have a foot injury, this code may apply, but only if it's not under another code. But there is a little exception here, which I found interesting. I can never understand some of these things because they don't give an example how that would be. Like it says you can still use the code on an analogy basis when it's something that's closely related. I don't know how could something be closely related to an injury. There are no real <laughs> elements either that you could argue. You know, I, I'm not I, sure how that would work. Yeah, I, I can't think of what is closely related to an injury. <laughs> A moderately severe injury. I, I don't know. But anyway, if you don't have a condition that's under, and there's lots of foot conditions, right? So you may have a condition that doesn't have a code. And if that condition resulted from an injury, this definitely would apply. And again, it can be up to a 30% rating depending on, on how it is. So everyone know, if you don't have an injury, pretty much you can't use the code. And if you have a diagnosed condition that has a code, you can't use this. Although, yes, those of you with injuries that don't have a code, this is where you would look. Uh, so, but let me tell you, I probably found thousands of decisions where people are arguing to use this code to get a higher rating. I think that probably resulted from uh, some other court decision. I don't re recall the name of it offhand that had stated that this code is a catch-all for foot conditions that aren't otherwise described because it says foot injuries, comma, other. They're essentially arguing that if you don't have one of the listed ones, then this is what you use. Uh, and the court in the answer he did state that that's that's not how this is to be uh, looked right. at. So that probably put a stop to some of that. I pretty much see, I haven't seen any judges at the board assign this code right, to mm -hmm. get a higher rating, uh, especially on, if they're looking back at backdating. Often what they'll do is they'll look at what the situation was in the record. And again, if a code applies, that's what they're going to use. Like I said, veterans, you can't be slick and use this code <laughs> most of the time, but it may apply with an injury that doesn't fit on the schedule. And I'm only going to bring this up because I think it's a possibility that someone who has, let's say, just say flat feet rated at 10%, which is a bilateral rating. I'm thinking if that foot also had arthritis that's that's service connected with my feet for example arthritis is also service connected with the flat feet that if i only had 10 i would argue that since i have incapacitating episodes and that the joints in the right and left foot are included in that rating i should have a 20 percent per arthritis but i think that situation probably doesn't come up very often for you veterans out there who might only have 10% for your flat feet, but if you also have arthritis service connected, then this might be something for you to look at and to argue. I certainly would. I think it's always worth a shot, right? If you have a colorable argument, um, you know, I'm certainly not for filing frivolous claims, but I think here you're, you're reading the regulations as they're written. And I think it's worth arguing. So I want to talk about pyramiding because it's a big deal with feet. I don't know if I ran across any veteran who has a single foot condition, right? It's usually multiple foot conditions. And then, of course, should they rate separately or should they not? What I find is if people have flat feet, that is basically the highest rating you're going to get within the foot. And all other codes won't get anything then. If you have multiple conditions, you're going to be rated for the highest rating amongst those conditions if they consider pyramiding a factor. If flat feet, for example, are rated at 30 and all these other conditions are rated at 10, then you're only going to get to 30 typically. You're not going to get like all those things because of pyramiding. They just don't allow all the separate things to be rated on a foot. Typically, that's what I see. Is that what you see also? I do. Um, and I think it 
it makes sense uh, when you're, you know, thinking about your conditions to look at, you know, what does pyramiding mean? It means that you can't rate the same symptoms under two separate codes. So then you need to kind of drill down and figure out what are the symptoms, get real granular with it and separate them out to the extent possible, and then make an argument. You can see here, as we kind of alluded exactly. to- Exactly. This, this other case that we have here, this particular board judge did exactly what you said. Their representative argued, and the judge agreed, that their foot pain at the arch is separately rated from foot pain at the ball of the foot, for example. This particular judge allowed separate ratings where other judges wouldn't. At the board, a reasonable argument that separates those symptoms may in fact be all it takes for a judge to award separate ratings. Yeah. So absolutely something I would do is argue for those separate ratings, especially pain at these different parts of your foot, even with like a bunion. I mean, typically those are only painful with shoe wear. Only time you see that symptom. I just want to let veterans know there is a possibility out there, right? But most of the board judges are not going to rate those things separately. I think one other thing to think about when you're thinking about pyramiding is to make sure that whatever rating they are assigning is the most favorable one. And I think generally VA does a deep decent job of that, but I certainly wouldn't just take their assessment. You want to think about everything you have. And if they are going to limit you to being evaluated under one particular diagnostic code, I'd want to make sure it's the most favorable. Here's another case where, again, judges just aren't going to allow these separate ratings. For instance, this veteran has a 50% rating for this particular condition, but has these other conditions that they're just not going to allow those other foot conditions to be rated. But again, I think it's worth the argument, depending on what your symptoms are, like you said, there might, yeah. the symptoms might not overlap. So pyramiding, I think people should argue separate ratings for the different pain locations as the case that I pointed out here that did work for that particular veteran. I think just in terms of pyramiding, right? All you can do is make the argument and the more information you give about your symptoms, the more you delineate symptoms of one thing from the other thing, the better your chances are. And I think that goes back to statements again, that veterans need to be very descriptive of what their mm -hmm. foot problems are, their functional limitations, their pain locations. In other words, whatever symptoms you're having, be very descriptive so that it is possible to get some of these things separated out. Yeah. I wanted to mention something, although this isn't necessarily a foot case. For this, I have a foot example here, actually, where this veteran, was just, this is to me was, I hated this because I ran into so many of these over the years, where without the bilateral factor, it was like this case, it's 96. But with the bilateral factor, it's only 94. It sounds crazy. It sounds like that mathematically isn't even possible because bilateral ratings, you're gonna you're getting a 10% bump to those bilateral ratings. So how could it be less in the total health scheme of things? But sadly, it was less. I actually had, I would say, two veterans right before this ruling came out that I sent emails to right after they changed the rating schedule, where we're now veterans. If for some reason you're one of those veterans out there who got stuck with less, there's been a change to the schedule. Now it's the most favorable, whether it's if your bilateral rating is included and it only adds up to 94, but without bilateral adds up to 95 or above, you get the more favorable rating. It only took Congress like you know, 20 years to get that fixed. Veterans out there, if you were stuck in that condition, now that's been fixed. Thank goodness. You know, bilateral ratings, I had this question asked to me a number of times. Okay, so I have bilateral flat feet rated at 50%. Do I still get the bilateral fat? Factor. And here was a, a, a board case anyway, where the veterans attorney argued that they should. And this judge made it clear, you just can't. So, and you can't, right? I mean, if you have a bilateral rating for 30 or 50, you can't also get the bump or, or can you? Because that depends on who is ultimately deciding your case. Uh, certainly. <laughs> exactly. It has been applied uh, in general. The general rule is that you have a bilateral rating that's already factored into that overall evaluation and therefore or you don't get the bilateral factor bump. But there is a manual provision that relates to when the bilateral factor is to be applied. It does state that uh, generally, like I said, the bilateral factor is not applied where there is a bilateral evaluation unless some other criteria are met, 
where there are other conditions of the same side of the body that would allow assignment of that bilateral factor. So I think it's not necessarily cut and dried, although, you know, certainly generally the way VA would apply it is that they would not assign the right. bilateral factor. So I, I get what you're saying. So if I had like flat feet rated at 30% on the bilateral rating, that they're not going to also give me 10% just for that. However, mm -hmm. if my knee on that same appendage was rated, then maybe it would get counted into the factor calculation. Okay, yeah, that, right. makes, that makes sense. As a matter of fact, and I have an example of exactly, I think, where that happened right here, right? Is mm -hmm. That's exactly what the judge did in this case, is since they had other conditions on that appendage that were also rated, they included that 10%. So exactly what you said happened in this particular case. So veterans, if you look at your rating code sheets, and those of you who don't have one, send for your file, there'll be a rating code sheet there. And it will show the things that they gave you the bilateral factor for. If you don't see your foot condition added into that, then they may have it wrong. The bilateral factor, it's very confusing for veterans because it's a bilateral rating, especially if it's at the 10% level. It makes sense. I get it. At the 30, the 50% level, you're getting a higher rating because it's both feet. But at the 10% level, you're just getting that 10, right? So there's no extra bump, right? Um, that's included in that particular rating, even though it clowns both your feet. So it makes sense that that 10% would be added in if these other conditions are there. So I just want to make veterans aware of that. Any other thing to say about the bilateral factor? This is our last slide uh, for you veterans who are anxiously waiting for the end of the video. <laughs> no, I, thankfully that, that error has been corrected and it's just something to pay attention to that a lot of people probably pass by on the code sheet. Give it a look, see if you've been impacted. Yeah, because feet is to me one of the more complicated things because you have so many different things could be wrong with the feet. Feet affect so many other parts of the body. Then you have pyramiding rules and you have bilateral factors. I mean, it's just a complicated process that veterans, if you're not on the ball with these things, which is one reason I'm making the video, is to let you know that there's a lot of things involved when it comes to feet. So if you have questions, definitely seek out either representation, you can call me, right? But the point is, probably don't try to go through these things yourself. So yeah, else to say about feet? No, I agree with what you said. There's surprisingly a lot at play here, you know, pyramiding, the amputation rule, all kinds of things to think about when you're looking at the feet. You need to talk to somebody who's been through this before. You need to have a great representative who can break all this down for you and help you see where kind of where you fit. Oh, last thing I want to mention. So you veterans out there, remember we're talking possibility of loss of use of feet. We talked about loss of use in this video. Just remember if you get loss of use of your feet, you may in fact have a special monthly compensation rating available. Don't try to go through these things yourself. They're pretty complicated and you may have benefits that you might not even realize if you don't really know what you're doing. All right, then that's it for this video. Um, I'm going to say goodbye, veterans. Goodbye, veterans. Goodbye, veterans. Thank you. I appreciate having the opportunity to be here. If you haven't bought the book yet, go buy it now. It's called The Irate Veteran, available at Amazon. What else would it be called, right? And it tells my story. And it also tells the problems at the Veterans Administration. It also has my recommendations for how to fix those problems. So every veteran needs to read it. Matter of fact, every American needs to read it. And that's all I got to say. Irate veteran, out.